Greetings, uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, good night, depending on where you are. It's one of the joys of this uh, exciting new Zoom era. Thank you very much for joining us for our second Zoom webinar uh, from SOMA on conversations of science, magic, and society. Our topic today is on magic, charlatanism, and skepticism. And I'm really excited to be here to be moderating this particular panel. We've got a lovely lineup of some excellent people with wonderful experiences uh, in this particular field from different perspectives. Uh, so of our panelists, we've got, uh, first of all, Jamie Ian Swiss, who probably needs no introduction to most of you, uh, internationally acclaimed sleight of hand artist, author, speaker, and magician. Jamie's appeared internationally for presenters from Fortune 500 companies to the Smithsonian Institution, numerous television appearances, uh, shows and lectures across the world, a lengthy profile in the New Yorker declared Swiss as being widely thought to be one of the most masterfully, masterly, to possess one of the most masterly sleight of hand techniques in the world today. Um, our other panelists include Professor Carolyn Watt, who holds the Kostler Chair in Parapsychology at the University of Edinburgh, having started her career as a founding member of the Kostler Parapsychology Unit under Professor Robert Morris. Morris espoused the value of conjuring expertise when studying claims of the paranormal and recruited a youthful Richard Wiseman and Peter Lamont to help him with his team. Watt currently runs the Parapsychology Study Registry and her teaching and research highlights wider scientific lessons that emerge from studying paranormal claims. And last but not least, we've got Professor Chris French, who's the Professor Emeritus in the Department of Psychology at Goldsmiths, the University of London, where he's also the head of the Anomalistic Psychology Research Unit. He frequently appears on radio and television, casting a skeptical eye over paranormal claims. He's a fellow of the Committee of Skeptical Inquiry, and he writes for The Guardian and The Skeptic Magazine as a former editor of the latter. Without further ado, I'd like to give the virtual stage over to Jamie Ian Swiss. Jamie, take it away. Thank you for being here. Greetings, a pleasure. My friend Danny Hillis has three kids. When Danny's kids were in their early adolescence, he hired a private magic tutor for them. He had no desire for them to become professional magicians. He's a pretty smart guy after all. In fact, he's a world-class technologist and computer scientist with over 300 patents to his name. He was a past VP of R&D at Disney Imagineering, much more. Uh, he gave his kids magic lessons because he believed that the experience of learning and doing magic could provide an invaluable life lesson. Like every young magician starting out in magic, Danny's kids learned a fundamentally important critical thinking lesson that what you see is not necessarily what you should believe. I learned that lesson when I started magic at about the age of seven. And by the time I was nine or 10, I was reading whatever I could get my hands on about Harry Houdini. What first captivated me about Houdini wasn't his extraordinary escapes. Rather, I was taken by his very public campaign late in his life, exposing phony spirit mediums in the age of spiritualism and spirit seances. When spiritualism became a religious fad that swept the United States and England in the latter half of the 19th century, numerous prominent scientists came to believe that they were witnessing seance mediums make genuine contact with dead spirits. The accomplished scientist William Crookes, who discovered the element thallium, spent three years testing several professional seance meetings, a number of whose supernatural abilities he eventually validated as genuine. In each and every case, he was fooled by magic tricks. Crooks was certainly not stupid, but he was thoroughly deceived, and he was only one of many such prominent scientists. When I first read about Houdini, I was inspired by the idea of a professional deceiver who was obsessed with the truth. Houdini was an exemplar of the notion of honest lying. At the turn of the 20th century, the great American magician Carl Germain said, and I quote, conjuring is the only absolutely honest profession the conjurer promises to deceive and does. This is an idea that would later become exemplified for me, by, for me by the late James Randi, who not unlike Houdini was a professional escape artist and magician who became a timeless fraud buster and debunker of uh, paranormal claims, a MacArthur award-winning author and the public face of the modern scientific skepticism movement and whose famed million dollar challenge I helped administer. Now, this notion of honest lying speaks to the social contract that's automatically and implicitly invoked between magicians and our audiences the moment we take the stage and use words like magician or illusion or deception. And this idea of honest lying serves to illustrate why it's not problematic to use illusions and trickery to promote truth. 
In fact, <clears throat> the interrelationship is a long-standing one. The very first book ever published in English that included the explanation of magic tricks entitled The Discovery of Witchcraft by Reginald Stott, published in 1584, was not intended as a book about magic, but rather as a book of skepticism and rational inquiry intended to question the quality of evidence being used to prosecute witches in Jamesian England. So Scott's discovery established what is now more than a four century interrelationship between the published re in the in the, in the published record, sorry, between magic and critical thinking. In the book, Visual Explanations, I co-wrote a chapter with information design pioneer, Edward Tufte. In the chapter called Explaining Magic, we wrote that since, quote, magical illusions are based on techniques that deny, conceal, obscure, and manipulate optical information, we therefore posited that, again, quote, to create illusions is to engage in disinformation design. So if magic is a model for disinformation design, does an understanding of the workings of magic tricks help us to more readily see through disinformation to become better rational thinkers? Well, as mentioned in that video that I didn't know we were gonna play, in the mid 1970s, the illusionist Doug Henning was one of the two most famous magicians in America. Henning was a devotee of the cult of transcendental meditation and was eventually manipulated by that cult to abandon his career and become a promoter of that cult's teachings of transcendental levitation and a vaporware project to create a Veda land theme park that would never break even one shovel full of ground. Knowledge of magic is no surefire inoculation against being fooled, be it by others or by our own fallible human minds. Thank you very much, Jamie. Wonderful introduction, nice historical context, and a good little shout out to intellectual humility, which I suspect is gonna be a recurring theme throughout this discussion. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, uh, so before we open it up broader, could we hear from uh, Professor Watt? Sure, call me Caroline, please. Um, so first of all, a caveat, I'm, I'm not a magician, although I live with one and there's a giant magic poster on the wall just to prove, <laughs> prove my case. And um, so I'm a parapsychologist and um, Chris and Jamie very kindly allowed me to talk about Project Alpha, which is really the overlap, the, the most best known overlap between magic and parapsychology, which is my my area. So I hope I could give you a, a kind of timeline of what I think are the highlights or the, the significant moments in Project Alpha, and then we can perhaps discuss um, the implications of that later on. Um, so I, probably some of you have already heard about this. Um, so it was... Um, began in the 1970s with MacLab, which was a privately funded um, parapsychology lab at Washington University uh, under the direction of a physicist called Peter Phillips. And um, not long after they got off the ground, two psychics, that is two young magicians, posing as psychics, presented themselves to be tested as the, the lab was uh, calling for psychics to be tested. And because P Phillips was a physicist, he was interested, I think Geller was kind of catching the news at the time, um, he was interested in metal bending and PK feats, alleged paranormal feats. And these two magicians were Steve Shaw, aged 18, now Banachek, still active, I think quite friendly with Jamie, if I'm out, and Michael Edwards, only 17 years old. And they were actually set up by James Randi to go into this lab and to essentially uh, see if they could cheat the parapsychologist to reveal the lax controls that the parapsychologist imposed in their attempts to test psychic claimants. Um, and I think it's fair to say that Peter Phillips and some of the other scientists involved were personally impressed by the work, the, the, the apparent paranormal feats of the two magicians. Um, although there was never a formal endorsement in, in the form of a published journal article. Um, in 1981, this was a kind of piv pivotal moment, if you like, in the story. Um, the uh, Mac Lab presented a research brief and a workshop film to the convention of the Parapsychological Association, at which James Randi was present, and also, obviously, a lot of other parapsychologists who were not part of the, the Mac lag were present. And at that, um, the accounts that I've read said, and Randi's said, that the film that Phillips presented of the feats of these um, boys was, um, Randy said, less than enthusiastically received by parapsychologists and other um, reports 
Michael Thalborn, who was a member of MacLab, described it as an extremely hostile reaction from the parapsychologists. So the parapsychologists basically cautioned that, that they did not think that the controls were adequate. Randy also cautioned and sent advice to Phillips in writing about guidelines that he should try to follow. And if you've seen the Honest Liar documentary, it's quite interesting because you see up-to-date interviews with the, the two protagonists who explain how as time went on, um, the controls tightened and they found it harder to, um, to uh, produce these feats um, that they had initially managed to fool the parapsychologist with. Um, in 1982, Randy awarded the Straight Spoon Award so not the bent spoon, but the straight spoon, which is for, for um, uh, good good research to Peter Phillips. Uh, and this was um, because he had modified his protocols in response to feedback from the parapsychologist and the um, advice from Randy himself. Um, in a letter from Randy to Phillips, he says, this award was for your cautious approach to your work recently evidenced. However, in 1983, uh, Randy went to a press conference with um, Discover magazine, and this basically brought the Project Alpha to, to a head, where he um, uh, exposed the two uh, magicians. Well, they, they, they basically explained that they had cheated, that all of the feats that they had demonstrated had been fraudulent. So this caused a sensation. Unfortunately, Phillips wasn't invited to the press conference, so he wasn't able to give his side of the story. But it was definitely a sensational um, ending. And it, it had a huge impact, I would say, on parapsychology, um, perhaps more than the, the actual facts of the event, which is, you know, that Phillips never actually endorsed, uh, formally endorsed the, the boys' um, capabilities, the alleged psychic capabilities. Um, but the impact went far beyond that. This is Randy's great talent, I think, for um, uh, publicity, if you like, and for making making an impact. The impact went way beyond the, the facts of the actual case in, in, in question. Um, there were reactions from Marcello Truzzi, a sociologist, um, who looked at whether this was a, a really an example of science or not, um, or was it sh showmanship from Michael Thalborn, who compared the argument was it science or showmanship. And probably the most important reaction for the parapsychologists was the Parapsychological Association in 1983 resolved that uh, it would in future um, draw up a list of conjurers who were members of professional associations and who were willing to act as consultants for certain kinds of um, parapsychological research, particularly if you're testing claimants where having conjuring expertise is useful. Um, there are some ethical issues that we might discuss about this, this, um, this, this kind of several years worth of, of effort. But um, I think there were also obviously some gains to science and to um, parapsychology as a result. So perhaps we can discuss these. And also we had our own little um, uh, brush with a magician at Edinburgh in 1983, um, which was actually, we, you know, I won't spoil the ending of the story, but uh, if anyone wants to know, and it could tell us a little bit more about this in, in the discussion. So we had a little kind of non, non, it wasn't Project Beta, <laughs> but we had our own person came in in 1983 and um, just before my time and pretended to be psychic. So I'll tell you more about that if anyone wants to hear. But over over to you now. Intriguing. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Project Alpha, of course, a lovely kind of platform to be discussing some of these issues. I suspect we'll be hearing more about that in some further discussion. Uh, but before we open things up, uh, let's hear from Professor Chris French. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I don't have anything to say that would disagree with anything that's already been said. Um, I kind of I kind of look back at what we were supposed to be talking about and can magic encourage critical thinking? Well, yes, I think definitely it can. Um, for me, I mean, one of the things about um, skepticism is it's one thing to kind of speculate about stuff and to offer speculative ex explanations for this claim or that claim or the other claim but it's really nice when we can actually uh, not only offer those explanations but provide some evidence to back them up um, and and that's what we can actually do i mean it's you know not many people are in the position that can do that 
Um, I am, Caroline is, Richard Wiseman is, and various other kind of people working in academia. We can set up an experiment to actually look at it. <clears throat> and um, so just to give you one example of that kind of, you know, th 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 there's kind of two main points I want to make. The first is to illustrate, yes, we can encourage critical thinking uh, to, to echo what Jamie said, just to kind of make the point that you can't always believe what you think you may have seen. Um, going back to the kind of days of <clears throat> Uri Geller, I, I, I was in the sixth form at school when Uri appeared on the scene. <clears throat> back in those days, I believed in a lot of this stuff. And I was so excited when he appeared because not only, you know, did he kind of, was he a sensation, but there was there were scientists, proper scientists who were saying, yes, he really can do this stuff. He really can bend metal just by gently stroking it. And I was so excited and I really wanted to believe it was true. <clears throat> Sadly, many decades later, when I've got to know many, many conjurers and mentalists and all those kind of you know, people who just take the magic out of life. No, they don't really at all. Um, but <clears throat> they can do the same thing. They can do the same thing. And I've, you know, I, I, I kind of watch them doing it. And what they say is, it's a trick. It's sleight of hand. It doesn't involve any kind of psychic powers at all. And if Uri Geller is using psychic powers to achieve this effect, he's doing it the hard way because it looks just the same when you do it as a trick. And I, I can't really argue with that. And you kind of look back through the kind of claims that have been made. You look at the kind of papers that have been published, the chapters and so on. And yeah, uh, basically, there is no good evidence that Uri Geller could bend spoons or any other utensil um, just purely by psychokinetic ability. Um, so, but but lo, what a lot of people would say was, well, yeah, but I've seen him do it. I've seen him do it. Back in the 1970s, I saw him do it. And he would put the object down on a table and it continued to bend. That cannot be sleight of hand. He wasn't even touching it. Back in the day, that would have actually been quite an argument uh, in so far as, whereas today you can buy gimmicked, I believe, I'm told, uh, objects that would <laughs> continue to bend. Back in the day, you couldn't. So what was going on there? Now, uh, <clears throat> Richard Wiseman, um, who, you know, as, as many listeners will know, is not only a member of the Magic Circle, he's a member of the Inner Magic Circle. Uh, he knows all about the power of suggestion. Uh, and, and many, many mentalists and conjurers would have assumed this is just down to the power of suggestion. But again, Richard went that one step further and he proved that it was down to the power of suggestion. Lovely experiment, very simple experiment. Took a video of an alleged psychic who was in fact a conjurer who, who was using a sleight of hand to bend a key. Uh, the interesting part comes after he's done that, he puts the key down on the table and in one condition, the people viewing the video hear the alleged psychic say, if you look closely, you'll see it's still bending. The other condition is exactly the same, but you don't get that suggestion. Those who get the suggestion, about 40% report that they think the key carries on bending. In the other condition, virtually nobody does. So a really simple manipulation, a really strong effect, which is quite unusual for psychology, I have to say. Um, we, we, I was very impressed with that. I thought it was a really, really nice result. Um, we took that idea and we, we threw in a memory conformity element. Memory conformity is about where your memory for what you just witnessed might be influenced by what someone else says about it. So we got, we got uh, people to watch the video in pairs and then report to discuss what they'd seen and then to report back to us afterwards independently what they had seen. Now what the genuine participants in our study didn't know was that the other person was actually a stooge who was working with us. So they would watch their video together and then discuss it and if you depend on what condition you were in, the co your co-witness might say, yes, the key carried on mending, or no, the key did not carry on mending. And what we showed 
If you were in the condition where you had both the suggestion from the sidekick and the reinforcement from the co-witness, we got up to levels of 60% of people saying they thought the key carried on mending. So it's not just what's happening while you're witnessing the event, it's also what happens afterwards that can influence your memory. And again, I think that's a nice illustration of a, 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 a situation where you kind of might hear about the power of suggestion, but if we can actually present empirical evidence to show, look, this really does happen. It's not just skeptics sounding as if they're kind of trying to come up with explanations that they're just kind of, you know, plucked out of the air. It's actually got some real empirical evidence behind it. So that's the, that's the first point I want to make. Can magic encourage critical thinking? Yes, it absolutely can, in exactly the way that, that, that Jamie made the point that it can. Um, one, of the other, one of the other questions that was kind of up there for this, for this debate was, is it problematic to use illusions and trickery to promote truth? And uh, yeah, I think it can be. No, so this is the kind of second major point I want to make. Um, I think one of the issues that we have is that certain um, conjurers and mentalists um, are a little bit kind of have, have an interesting relationship with the truth. So um, I'm not going to name any names, but you may well think that you know who I'm talking about or the kind of people I'm talking about. Um, there are certain Why not? Kind of Please do name the names. Please do name the names. I, I will if you won't. Honestly, Jamie, I won't need to. <laughs> you will know. But, but I'm not a mind reader, so I'm not sure exactly really which insist, names you have in mind. If you really insist, I will. There are certain kind of mentalists who appear and, and do amazing, amazing things in TV shows, on, on stage and so on, and claim that they are achieving these effects purely by applying psychological science. Um, and basically... Some of the times that's just complete bullshit. Uh, that's not how they do it at all. They're using kind of principles of magic that were, they've been established for centuries and they're just dressing it up in new clothes. Um, and I think one of the kind of, I think one of the best examples of this is the kind of whole thing. I, I, I have a real kind of interest in uh, cold reading versus hot reading. Again, many of our listeners tonight, I hope, will know what I'm talking about, but just in case you don't, uh, cold reading is a whole set of techniques that you can use to convince, convince complete strangers that you know all about them. If you want to set yourself up as a fake psychic, they're very useful skills to have. And on, on the basis of those skills, I kind of pass myself off on daytime TV in the UK as having psychic powers. I don't have any psychic powers. Um, that is, yeah, again, I'm if, if, sure you all know what cold reading is but if you do need any more information ask at the q a hot reading is a completely different thing cold reading is when you you have genuinely not mentioned not met the person before and you're doing a, a, an apparent psychic reading for them and it's based on various kind of principles about using the statements that actually apply to pretty much everybody but putting them in a certain way and the way you ask questions and so on um hot reading is a very different thing. It's where you have actually done your research on the person in advance. So you go through then this charade of obtaining the information psychically, but actually you already knew all this stuff before you even started doing the reading. You just pretend that you're picking it up psychically. Now, one of the things that interests me is the way that skeptics can be misled about the power of cold reading. So I think that sometimes um, there, is, there is a kind of danger when there are certain people who present the kind of way they're achieving their effects as being done on the basis of psychological science, when really it isn't at all. Um, and it's kind of overselling psychology for me. So, you know, I mean, psychology really is not that powerful. We cannot tell where you went on holiday in 2007 from the way your left eyebrow twitched. We just cannot do that. And I think it's a very good thing that we can't do that. Um, but it's, it's this kind of notion. So sometimes you will kind of get a situation where you'll see somebody 
doing an amazing reading and a part of a TV program or something. Uh, and skeptics will be sitting there saying, no, it's all cold reading, it's all cold reading. And I think, no, 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 that's not cold reading. It's too specific. It's too specific. You can't do that with cold reading. People might misremember it as being very specific, but it wasn't that specific at the time. And I don't think that these kind of fake explanations that are given, you know, the reason that you chose that particular word from a random selection in a book that you just opened for the first time was this word, which I had up on the back screen all the time. I don't think that if you kind of explain that in terms of pseudo psychology, you are actually doing skepticism any good. Because basically you're lying. And it's this, it's this whole notion that sometimes, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm going on a bit actually, but I, <laughs> it's sometimes that kind of mentalists and conjurers can kind of appear to be changing hats and saying, yeah, okay, for that part of the demonstration, I was being a magician, I was being a conjurer, I was being an honest, an honest liar, to use James' term. But now I've taken that hat off and now I'm totally telling you about the science behind it when really you're not, you still kept the same hat on and you're lying. And that for me is, is, is a big problem. I know it is not a big problem for many, many conjurers and mentalists. And I'd be quite interested to see what Jamie's got to say about that. And I'm sure he's gonna tell me. So uh, I'll finish on that note. Thank you very much, Chris. A lot to unpack here. So we've got uh, kind of the Project Alpha sort of situations. And there was, I think we've hinted at some kinds of uh, possibly some disagreements about some of the ethical ramifications of that that I would like to circle back to. Um, and also some great stuff about issues with uh, kind of pseudo psychological explanations as a theatrical conceit within a magic performance and what kinds of responsibilities people have whether they present themselves as science communicators or not, like are there potentially negative consequences? I think there seems to be an agreement that there can be. Um, but let's circle back to the uh, the Project Alpha situation because that was sort of connects a couple of things. Carolyn, so you mentioned that you had some kind of ethical qualms with the way that Project Alpha was handled. There was some mentions of kind of the showmanship versus the facts of the case. Um, would you like to start us off with uh, expanding on that a little bit, and we can hear from other folks about what they think. Well, uh, there've been a couple of analyses of that by um, Marcello Truzzi, who's a sociologist, and Michael Tholborn. So I'm really sort of looking at Michael Tholborn, who's a parapsychologist who um, joined Mac Lab. So he was kind of in the latter stages, if you like, and he's written quite a, a detailed, you know, perspective. I, I, I would I would disagree with anyone who says that there is such a thing as the truth. Uh, by the way, I think. There are vers everyone's got their narrative, if you like. So Dalborn's narrative is that there there were some ethical problems with uh, Project Alpha. Um, one was that there was use of fraud. Um, it, it's not actually being an honest liar in this particular example because the the researchers did not know that they were being lied to. It was perhaps their job to find out, but they didn't know. It's not like a normal magic performance. Um, mm -hmm. And th there was some criminality as well. There was breaking and entering into the lab outside of ours and tampering with some of the lab equipment. Um, if this had been a genuine experiment, then um, you would expect a kind of ethical review process. Um, and there would be some oversight of the ethics. And this didn't go through. Project Alpha didn't go through any kind of ethical review. Um, most psychologists and scientists do have to put their work through ethical review if they're doing work with human participants and animals. Um, apparently, according to Thalborn, um, the director of the ethics office at the American Psychological Association when told about Project Alpha said, it, it sounds like something we would have been interested in, <laughs> um, that this would fall under their remit as something that, that would, if it had a negative impact, would have been um, deserved censure. Um, and the mode of termination, um, the way that the, the hoax was revealed, I think, um, could, well, I'm not sure. Most most researchers would write up their, their work. They might um, invite a reply from the person who they're, they're um, exposing or uh, writing about to make sure that they've not missed anything. It would be subject to peer review and it would be published in a peer reviewed journal rather than being revealed at a press conference um, and then later on talk shows um, without uh, the, 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 the director of the lab having a say or a voice in it. So I think those, those sides, I think, are the, the, the areas where there's sort of ethical problems. 
So I would uh, add add to that, and not to debate Carolyn's points. Every one of Carolyn's, every point Carolyn uh, raises is a legitimate part of the discussion of looking back on Project Alpha. Of course, all that is in the context that Randy was not a scientist, never claimed to be a scientist, and was trying to have an impact on something in a different way first that he was denied, that he was welcome, that you know he he offered his services in one way, was denied, and figured out another way to have an impact. And I would say that the bottom line in many ways is what you said in your original talk, which is mm -hmm. it had a positive yes. and lasting impact. It's that his point is unarguable. The I whole agree. the whole attitude in parapsychology towards changing claimants has changed as a result. So if Randy was a psychologist was a scientist, then every single one of those complaints is valid. Um, he did not have the opportunity to seek that advanced peer review as a scientist. It wouldn't been it was it would have been the equivalent of him being welcomed in the first place. Uh, you know, it's much, it's not unlike it's not unlike um, the famous for, more or less first book about cognitive dissonance. Um, um, uh, when prophecy about the, fails, yeah, That's when true. prophecy fails about Beautiful cardinal book. cults which that experiment could never be done today is be completely unethical. And yet someone tell me that we look back on that, that any psychologist today looks back on that and says, oh, it's a shame they got, they did that. I can just we look back and we used to go, thank goodness they did it, right? It's a yeah. It was a fascinating thing. It gave birth to the whole notion of, of uh, cognitive dissonance. So take that in the context of the time. The other small, but I think very significant point that always needs to be mentioned about Project Alpha is that the boys were in clearly instructed by Randy that if they were at, at any time, if they were directly asked a question by the experimenters, are you cheating? If they were asked that question or any form of that question, are you doing magic tricks? they were to immediately answer honestly. And both of them, Mike and Steve, will confirm that. Randy always said it. That was an absolutely uncompromising instruction. They were never asked. If we need to say anything more about what the flaws were, it's virtually summed there. Also, I'll just say for our viewers, um, the story of Project Alpha, as recounted in the Wikipedia page, is actually pretty good. If you want to look at further details about Project Alpha, can, can I just come in there as well? Just to, I mean, I, I I covered Project Alpha on on my course on anomalistic psychology, um, and I included in a reference to Falbon's paper because I think he makes some valid points, as as we've all agreed here. Um, but overall, I, I tend I agree with Jamie that. It's one of those um, ethically controversial studies, if you want to even call it a study in the kind of scientific sense. Um, but in the, who can deny that we learned something very, very useful and valuable from it? I, mean, I kind of, you know, I think of the kind of um, you know, Stanley Milgram experiments and so on, which would never get past an ethics board now. But I think they tell us so much more about many of the experiments that do get through ethics boards today and i'm not saying that therefore we should allow them to happen values change guy you know all that sort of stuff changes but for me you know I, when i've taken home that message from the milgram studies i've taken home the message from bystander behavior studies and so on and so forth and i, I think they tell us a great deal about human behavior and one of the things that irritates me just to go off on a slight tangent is the fact that you can get away with doing all these kinds of things that we as scientists might view as being totally unethical in the name of entertainment if it's for a tv program but in the name of science, you would never get it past an ethics board, you know, but hey, you know, that's just the way life is. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, mean, I, I think we're probably all in, I think we're probably all in agreement on this, that we did learn something very, very valuable. And the irony is that while parapsychologists, in my experience, genuinely took on the lessons of Project Alpha, not one parapsychologist would ever, ever employ James Randi to be their... Um, yeah, they're, they're kind of magic expert on hand 
to evaluate uh, a, a paranormal claim. Oh, you know, there also there have been other changes that have that have have changed that landscape. Um, in the video that was played of Randy, he was he very briefly mentioned um, Israeli psychic uh, Ronnie Marcus, who I talk about in my in my new book, uh, who I confronted on television in New York City years ago. And uh, when Marcus came over doing very similar things to Geller uh, and also had a physicist in tow who probably was fooled and they were going to come to the States and in the 90s and do a tour of labs and so on, um, that tour got cut short because unlike when Geller was operating, yeah. uh, we had the Internet <laughs> and thanks to the Internet, Every single lab, whether they wanted to hear from magicians or not, there were skeptical magicians showing up and contacting every single lab across the way going, hey, you want some help? You want somebody to look at this guy? He's doing magic tricks. And there was a whole tour that had been planned that got cut short. They bailed out. They ran with their tails between their legs. And he booked a last minute uh, TV spot in New York City in the news, in the five o'clock news, literally because he was coming through New York to catch his flight back to Israel and through uh, channels, just chance. But same same thing, technology. I, I got a call and showed up at the studio that day and confronted him on camera. So time, nice times change, times change. Can, can we I hear a lot about the kind of the... Oh. Matt, if you don't mind, I mean, because sure. I am very interested to know. I know I kind of know a lot of. I've got a lot of friends who are conjurers, as you know, Matt, um, and uh, their attitudes to certain as yet unnamed mentalists and conjurers who do this kind of pseudo explanation in terms of psychological science. When I'm watching it and thinking, I don't really think that's the correct explanation because if it was, given my research interests. I know about those, you know, that that tech, that 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 effect that you're talking about. Um, but a lot of the kind of mentalists and conjurers I kind of seem to still be kind of quite happy that various big name performers do present these pseudo explanations. And whether it's because they kind of see it as, well, actually, we all know that kind of psychics and people claim these powers, you know. Uh, it uh, are either either have other problems or they are using fraudulent techniques and so therefore we should just expose them and show it doesn't really list clear all this kind of stuff. Um I have a problem with that as I say as I as I make clear I hope. Um and so so Jamie, I mean how how do you feel about is is it a kind of situation Well you're not you alone in that, having a problem about that, Chris. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, but, but, the, that's just the current iteration. That's the current form of that debate, which has been going on in mentalism as long as there's been something called mentalism, especially in the 20th century, since uh, Dunninger, who kind of defined and created modern mentalism. Um, and so, you know, there are different sides in this debate. I've written about this extensively in my work. I'm outspoken about it. Uh, I think conjurers, magicians, tend to be more on the skeptical side, not uniformly, but still they tend to weigh more on the skeptical side and look somewhat askance at those kind of exaggerated claims or spongy claims. Um, I think in the mentalist world, it's a little different as Penn Jillette used to say many years ago in his show, there are some mentalists who look upon Yuri Geller as just a peer with work. Uh, so, um, and indeed, you know, Geller, has recast himself as a motivational speaker. And I was in a room at a magic convention after he did a 90 minute self-promoting so-called talk. It was basically a promotional catalog of his work and a demonstration of sociopath uh, repeatedly telling an audience that uh, actions have no moral consequences. Um, and he got a standing ovation. So, uh, you know, part of the, partly that's the power of celebrity, you know, just, hey, this guy's working. Uh, mm. But in the mentalist arena, there's more debate about this. And there is an art. There's absolutely an art. And there are people who think it doesn't matter what you say, because as long as you're selling a ticket, it's clear what the context is. I don't believe that's true. 
Um, there's the, there, one of the biggest arguments, which is actually a non-argument when it comes to simple logic, is that, uh, well, there's always some people who no matter what you tell them, they're going to believe anyway. So therefore, I have no more, response, no, more, no more responsibility to talk to anyone. That's a position, if you want to even call it qualified as a position, I find ludicrous and uh, unsupportable. And I talk about it in my new book as and elsewhere. Uh, and then there's this middle ground. There's a big difference. There is a difference between a phony psychic. Well, that's redundant. A psychic outright explicitly claiming super, supernatural abilities and a mentalist who's doing some, who's you know being spongy about it and vague. Um, but I agree with you that what's happened is, is that um, in the last 25 years or so, there's that the new psychic claim for mentalists is not, I, I can read your mind by supernatural powers or by gift from aliens, which was Geller's claim. Uh, but I, uh, when I was in the crib, this, I've heard this said, this is a, a Mark Salem, to, there's a name for it, uh, who was popular in New York and then, in the, in the last century, um, you know, I, when I was in the crib, I seemed to have the uncanny ability to uh, read people's body body language. Okay, uh, you know, I think I think Chris, you invoked the scientific term bullshit. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, and there's a feeling that that's a gray area. I, I don't think that's morally. Uh, uh, defensible. I also don't think it's theatrically interesting. And one of the most interesting commentaries about that, and I'll leave it on this, uh, because I could talk about this issue all day, um, is the introduction to uh, one of Banachek's books, uh, Psychological Studies, Volume 1, that was written by Teller. And Teller makes the theatrical case, the theatrical case, that watching someone do a super, demonstrate a supernatural power is not theatrically interesting and loses the entire point of conjuring and what makes conjuring interesting, which is the cognitive dissonance that's created when you know something is impossible and you see it done in front of you. So then all you're doing is you're kind of hanging around somebody who's cooler than you are. I guess, you know, right? And it's a, that's a very interesting argument as well. Carolyn, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to pick up on, on, on mentalists' impact, it goes beyond entertainment and performance because uh, we'll, we'll talk about Darren Brown as, as an example. Um, as a psychologist... There's a name, Chris. There's a name. Uh, although Darren's interesting because he's dialed back somewhat on his original he has, claim. Right, he, not he, now, but... he now says he... His performance is a mixture of magic, psychology, and showmanship, or something like that, I think. So he's kind of mm -hmm. allowing for a bit more nuance now. Um, but um, he was more of a sort of body language, offering body language and psychology as explanation earlier. And Those early mind we, control episodes. Yes, exactly. And I used to get psychology students prospective students coming to me saying they wanted to study psychology because they wanted to be able to do stuff like Darren Brown can do. Yeah. So Which it goes. Right. It goes beyond. It goes beyond um, just entertainment. It has an impact on people's lives. I, how, I, how do you I, respond to students who say that to you? Because, like, on the one hand, it's cool that they're interested in psychology. On the other hand, obviously, I, what do you say to the students? I say Darren Brown is a practicing magician. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they <laughs> and the response to that? Do they seem deflated oh, by that? They, do they, become they are. In they're the disappointed. Of magic? No, they're, no, they're disappointed. I think. I think they'd like to think that um, the the pretend explanation is the real one. Mm -hmm. As a you know, psychologist, if we all could do that, we'd all we wouldn't need to work as psychologists. We'd all be millionaires. <laughs> I, I spoke on an academic program uh, at a university here a couple of years ago, uh, led by a very very prominent academic and. Um, at dinner afterwards, uh, this philosopher, who, uh, professor who was involved in all this, a really good guy, uh, happened to talk about how much he liked uh, Darren Brown and how he used Darren Brown's material as an example in his classes and had been for several years. And I said, do tell me more. And then he went on to explain it was the advertising uh, bit the, the, with the planted idea, so-called implanted idea, the one, the first routine, the first routine that made Darren really famous. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, listen to me carefully. You're using a magic trick. 
to teach your people science? Is it possible for you to reach every one of those students over the past five years and tell them they were misinformed? <laughs> Uh, and I really came down on him hard and, uh, and, event and he came back to me eventually and, and, you know, said he'd undone that work to the best he could and stop doing it. As far as Darren goes, since it's an uh, elephant in the room, um, Carolyn, he always used that little word showmanship in the midst of that list that goes way back to the okay. beginning of the series. Of course, the thing is, is that all those clips and segments, there's all this stuff about NLP, for example, that's probably in some ways the most damaging part of it because there's no such thing. Um, although mentalists believe in NLP, that's one of the great ironies. Okay, mentalists shut eye performance in, of it. Yeah, uh, exactly, that. exactly. Get that hook out of your mouth, boys. Um, mm -hmm. So mentalists believe in NLP, but I always say what I say. I'm, it's not my. I don't want to undermine someone at least I, who i consider a great performer and darren's a great he's a smart guy great performer he's he has in his two books for the public if you read those two books those books could have been written by skeptics they're different than what he says as a performer um and i know what he believes as an individual he's, he's as skeptical as they come and always has been always has been going back to the beginning um so you know so when people ask me, when non-magicians ask me, I say, if you come away from a Darren Bound piece and you have a strong suspicion as to what's really going on, you're wrong because that's exactly what he wants you to have. I know it's hard for you to process, but he's actually putting that in your head. And I kind of try and talk to people like that, like that about it. Darren's a complicated case, but he's had a lot of impact and yeah, I mean, I've seen his show where he does the um, demonstration, essentially, of faith healing. And it's, it's a oh, yeah. skeptical, powerful... Tap, totally skeptical. Totally yeah. skeptical. Yep, yep, absolutely. But on the other hand, in his current show that he ran in New York, I saw it off-Broadway in the, in the sort of the test run, and then he ran it on Broadway. There's one piece in there where he's talking to a person on stage about their dead relative. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think mm -hmm. that's to put yeah. not too fine a word on it, trashy. Yeah, well, no, no, I'm, I'm, I, I think, I suspect we're probably all in total agreement on, yeah. on that particular performer. I mean, I, and I agree people. with you, he's a great performer. He's, a, and he's done, he's done wonders for the world of magic and conjuring and so on. Um, I mean, one of the problems that it presents to kind of uh, run of the mill skeptical psychologists like myself is that we are sometimes faced with the, the kind of situation you just described yourself with uh, other professors of psychology saying well well how do you explain that then you know yep. um, and of course i'm not a conjurer i am not a mentalist i don't claim to have the inside knowledge i know a little bit about the kind of effects that can be achieved but but to just say well I'm not sure, but I, I'm sure it's a trick. Isn't a very convincing or compelling argument, you know? Right, and but so exposing methods is not a convincing of... or compelling argument either, because, you know, well, no, well, it's not, because I always give the analogy that, um, you know, I do demonstrations sometimes of gam cheating at gambling methods, right? And if I explain to someone, well, here's a way to deal cards from the bottom of the deck. Right. Here's one sleight of hand method to deal cards from the bottom of the deck. And by the way, if you notice the top card getting dusty, that's a that's a good clue, too. Um, but the thing is, if I actually teach that method now, that person becomes hustlers have a really good term for this. They call it half smart <laughs> because yeah. that person has, has a new confidence confidence that they have expertise that will protect them. So now they go to the weekly poker game. And they say, I met this guy who showed me how to deal from the bottom. And now I know what to look for. And the card cheat sitting at the table go says to himself, oh, I just need to change my method to the one that looks nothing like that. Yeah, like right? And it's tricks. the same thing. It's the same problem with yeah. trying to, to, you know, the most powerful thing a magician can do in a debunking sense is to duplicate the effect. Yeah. And that's what Randy always did. And Randy always said, Chris actually used his phrase, uh, 
you're doing it the hard way, right? If you're doing it with supernatural powers, you're doing it the hard way. Because the, my, the, my point is always, how can you tell? Can you tell the difference, whether it's fake or real? If you can't tell, what does that tell you? What's the simplest explanation? What does Occam's razor tell us? So exposing methods is not, is not the way. I, I, and again, just to emphasize that point, I mean, I made a reference to the difference between kind of hot reading and cold reading. That I think a lot of skeptics that, that they've kind of heard about cold reading, they know there is this technique, which which is very effective when used appropriately, but there are limits on a cold reading. You know, you, you oh, cannot. Right. Well, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what a universal reading is versus a cold yeah. reading. What what even cold reading actually means. People confuse yeah. that with universal readings. It's two different things. And then there's always speculation about hot readings. And in my new book, I'll conjure his conundrum. I talk about I was brought in on a. A criminal investigation years ago of a talk to the dead medium and the the law enforcement people were convinced they were watching hot readings and that's what they brought me in on and i said to them at the first meeting i said you know boys i would i would love to put this guy behind bars i, I praise you for being willing to look at that but i'm going to tell you right now my prediction is there's no hot readings he doesn't need it so the one thing I would say is, so we've heard about the magic in the classroom as kind of the horror stories. Um, if you guys are interested, uh, people listening and uh, anybody in general, uh, we will be talking because I think there are ways to use magic tricks as teaching tools to kind of promote good critical thinking, good research methods. We will be having a whole entire panel on that. Um, and again, I think in a meta kind of way, even those lessons like you were talking about, Jamie, where you've got this person who's using this uncritically in a classroom, the fact that you can have someone who has that level of knowledge that can be deceived in that way and use that in such a way, in a way, there's a beautiful lesson there yep. about the nature. Um, but you need to push people into that next level, which is, and that's a really, really critical step. Um, but I do want to push for some questions from the audience. Uh, so first one here is kind of a fun one. And this was something that I was thinking about a little bit too, especially as we're doing this virtually to kind of protect ourselves from like the invisible things that could kill us, um, which is this idea of how do you guys feel about how magic can kind of help people more broadly to kind of promote skepticism over things like uh, fake news or there's a lot of interesting claims under the guise of science communication happening currently, different things about the vaccinations uh, is a very topical one, obviously, or climate denialism. And a lot of these things are presented with the guise of critical thinking, right? So, I mean, you look at the anti-vaccination movement, they're just asking questions, they're presenting figures. And this seems like it can be a really tricky problem. I mean, this is literally killing people around us as we're talking about this. Do you guys, and again, with the massive blaring klaxon disclaimer that none of us are epidemiologists, do you guys think that there's lessons for magic that we can apply to the current science communication issues that we're seeing with things like fake news? I think, I think it goes back to what we've been talking about already, that, I mean, people, people want explanations. And sometimes the kind of explanation, if, if an explanation sounds kind of remotely plausible and you don't know an awful lot about that topic, then you may well buy into it. You know, so so kind of people when when Geller first appeared on the screen, there were people kind of there were skeptics saying, "Oh, he's he's using some special chemical that he's rubbing on the metal." And so, Milburn and so Christopher, forth. a uh, prominent magician, Milburn yeah. Christopher said that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, and so you know, uh, and that happens, um, and and so when we get a situation where um, you know, with, with really really obviously incredibly important issues like. Um, uh, the effects of vaccination and so on. If you can wrap up what you are selling in um, not only in sciencey sounding language, but also have some people who actually have genuine PhDs from genuine universities apparently promoting those ideas, then they will get traction. You know, they they will be they'll be memes, they'll be retweeted, and so on. And, and and we we you know we as well okay 
I think of us genuine skeptics. I know it sounds a bit pretentious. We're we're the right ones. In groups and out groups. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because that's exactly what I'm pointing into. I never met a true believer who didn't start the conversation by saying, you know, I'm a skeptic. Um, I was just doing research so, on that. It helps so, <laughs> to sell stuff. Yeah, so I would, if I could jump in, I'll, you know, I'll, I, I think magic is all but beside the point here. You know, at, 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 at you know, in order to avoid uh, the charge of Uber, of Ubers, <laughs> I'll say that um, the larger issue at stake has to do with the concerns of the skeptic movement. And the concerns of the skeptic movement are to ultimately to encourage a scientific worldview, critical thinking and rational inquiry. How do we do that? Um, we do that by raising a generation of young people who understand what the scientific method is. Uh, and, that's, and that's the real, that's the only inoculation that will help us because because um, what you have when you talk about the anti-vax movement is a perfect example of when I, I always say, bad thinking leads to bad choices, leads to bad outcomes. And the anti-vax movement before COVID, uh, bad thinking led to bad choices, led to bad outcomes and made this, the world a, a, a more dangerous place for my children, literally made the world a more dangerous place for my children, we got a return to mumps and measles in the United States, thanks to the anti-vax movement. Bad thinking. So how do you create, the real question is not how magic tricks are gonna help you do that. And not how are you gonna talk people out of a, out of a massive cult, okay? Because in, with what's going on the last four years in the United States, that has achieved cult status. People are in such a, a tight bubble of the big lie. The big lie is not a new invention, that we, didn't, we didn't just discover that. Um, how do you change those people's minds? Mostly you don't. Mostly you fight really hard to outvote them, wait for them to die, and try and educate their children. And you hope that the world survives the process. And so, you know, I, it, I'm not a professional educator. My saying this has no impact, clearly, because I've been saying it all my life. And it has no impact. But the fact of the matter is, is that instead of teaching children the periodic table of the elements who are not going to be chemists, we should teach them the scientific method and what that actually means. Simple mm -hmm. ideas like Occam's razor and the burden of proof is on the claimant and above all, how to judge sources, right? If there's one single thing, and this is, I have, repeated countless times to my high school age children, you know, whenever we're sitting in the car and they say, you know, I heard a story that, and I say, before you tell me the story, what was the source? I, I, I completely aggravate them with this constant question, right? Because all you have to do in the world is run your source through mediabiasfactcheck.com. And no, I am not, I do not get a percentage, um, <laughs> you know, and figure out the difference between a good source and a bad source. And to finish this thought, I'll add this. Skeptics invariably think that believers in pseudosciences and conspiracy theories and so on lack evidence. This is not true. Every lunatic idea, every believer in a lunatic idea believes they have evidence. The problem is it's crappy evidence. The problem is how do we define evidence, right? What's good evidence? What's bad evidence? What's good sourcing? What's bad sourcing, right? And so, you know, the real enemy is four years of people in America being told that mainstream media, the most responsible Pulitzer Prize winning media sources are the liars. Well, once you get somebody to believe that, we're screwed, screwed, okay? And we're so screwed that that's why in, in the United States, we had herd immunity in reach, and we will not achieve it. We will have to live with the virus. We will not hit 80% because bad thinking leads to bad choices, leads to bad outcomes. Teach young people critical thinking. And what that really means, it's the only help. Magic tricks in all humility are not going to do it. Can I just Fair enough. speak up there? Uh, can, we say, get... can, we, can we have a standing ovation for what Jamie? Because <laughs> <laughs> that was brilliant. Absolutely Thanks. spot on.
I Carol, like what to, you well, I, I, we I can't really follow that. I do agree with Jamie. That I think magic is probably not relevant to the question of vaccine hesitancy. And I have, I've done a little bit of research in the area of vaccine hesitancy, and you have to be very careful not to worsen the problem because the research is that if you try to correct vaccine misinformation by essentially repeating a myth about vaccination, um, people remember the myth uh, more. I've seen that. Yes, so, I've seen those. Things. So you get you get a kind of um, paradoxical effect where in the attempt to correct the myth, you actually make it worse. So we've got to be very careful to look at the research. That work predates vaccine, anti-vax. That, that, work, that, that, that work's been out for a while. I've got to come in now because I, I have spoken exactly along the lines that Caroline was just saying, and I believed it when I said it, otherwise I wouldn't have said it. And apparently... The research on kind of backfire effects of the kind that you're talking about, where you actually unintentionally promote the myth by trying to debunk it, it's actually the, the evidence is not that strong. So that so the latest the latest research on that from people like Stefan Lewandowski at Bristol and various others who are really kind of very actively working in this area is, you know, sorry guys, we kind of got that wrong. It, you know, debunking does work. Pre-bunking works even better. Um, and yeah, you know, I mean, I, and I think that, uh, yeah, I, I totally appreciate where you're coming from, Caroline. But I think that the, the most recent research suggests that we don't need to worry as much about backfire effects as maybe we thought we had to. So okay. what I can do is I can, if I can take sources on that, when we put the video recording up, I can have links for people if they want to look at actual speaking of the importance of sources, if they want to check out some of the research on this from each of you. The, the Debunker's Handbook by Stefan Lewandowski and various other people is a really great, it's, it's free to download, it's a really good resource, you know, it's, it's full of really good kind of research. We'll get that up there for sure. Um, Caroline, did you want to wrap? The thought, or no, no okay. that's fine. Um, I, <laughs> I think we are. I kind of feel, I kind of feel bad because I know I, I, I agreed with Caroline, and I've said the same thing myself up until quite recently. But yeah, I think yeah, just be careful with uh, with the the evidence. <laughs> like yeah, a no, it's a good beat on the importance of the kind of the research and conventional wisdom and how that can kind of shift as different things emerge and. Um, but yeah, I think we should probably, with respect to your time, start wrapping up. Um, I do have kind of one last question, um, especially given sort of the apocalyptic tone, which I think was very merited, that's kind of taken over. Um, one of the things that's come up is kind of the historical repetition of a lot of these sort of bad claims and bad thinking. Uh, but there's been hints as well from people talking about kind of general progress. I guess what I would love to finish on is kind of hearing from each of you, and it doesn't necessarily need to be directly magic related, um, and also for the record with the magic vaccines thing, I meant that more as kind of a metaphor for the broader points rather than like, ta-da, now you believe in vaccines. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, for the final question, um, I was wondering if you could talk, because you guys have had pretty immersive careers within the scientific community, around the scientific community, watching performers, seeing how the public ideas shift around kind of extraordinary ideas and weird claims. Can you tell us some kind of a positive shift that you've seen in the course of following these kinds of issues. And maybe we can hit it there, which again, not to put a, too much of a rosy lining on it, because there are real issues out there, but it might be nice to end a little bit optimistically. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm, I could talk about a positive shift within parapsychology. I don't mm -hmm. know if it really links with magic, but I, I think, and, and this actually is a, a shift for psychology as well, which is the recognition of the need to pre-register your research in order mm -hmm. to try to um, avoid the kind of multiple analysis problems, the false claims, essentially. So, sure. so uh, psychologists... Um, have kind of woken up to this issue. Parapsychologists got there before the psychologists, by the way, because they already had their replication problems. So mm -hmm. I, I'm seeing in psychology and in parapsychology a kind of um, realization that we need to be better methodologists. So that makes the future um, study studies will be more um, reliable, I should think, and informative. Lovely, thank you. I'll come in after Caroline and say that I agree entirely with what she just said. Um, I, I kind of, you know, just in my own kind of personal journey, I hate that phrase, but you know what I mean. Um, 
you know, I used to be a there. believer in a lot of as many of you know. Um, and then I, be, I kind of discovered the joys of skepticism and, and that genuinely was an exciting process and kind of getting to meet you know, people like James Randi and, and Ray Hyman and, and all these other fantastic people uh, you know, w was a real eye opener for me and, and, uh, and, and fantastic. Um, but I think I became a, I think I had a very biased view of parapsychology at that time. Um, and, and kind of felt that uh, you know, parapsychologists were generally incompetent and didn't understand statistics and didn't understand science and so on. And then gradually getting to meet them, including Caroline herself uh, and, and the late Bob Morris, you know, you realize actually this is total bullshit. These people really do know what they're talking about. And the parapsychologists were ahead of the game in terms of uh, the, the need for double blind procedures uh, pre-registration, all of those kind of things. They really genuinely were. Um, and I, I think there's still a lot of kind of skeptics out there who are kind of more influenced by the kind of type one skepticism, as I've called it, that uh, parapsychologists don't know what they're doing and it, 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 you know, that they could look at a, a, a published study and immediately spot the flaws in it. Well, no, you couldn't. It's, it's much more subtle and much more interesting than that. I don't believe personally, and I might be wrong, in the existence of paranormal forces, uh, but I could be wrong. And some of the evidence out there is not that easy to debunk. And uh, I think we as skeptics ought to kind of you know, treat it with the respect that it deserves. We, we, there's, there's bad science and good science in all areas. Um, but the parapsychologists definitely were ahead of the game in lots of respects. And so, yeah, absolutely agree with Caroline on that. Nice, thank you. Thank you. And that brings it to you, Jamie, I think. Uh, optimistic wrap-up. I confess I'm still slightly mystified, but I agree there are, I know scientists like Carolyn who are, who, and others who, Lamont and so on, who are serious in the parapsychology field, but I, 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 I confess I'm a little mystified by a science that's 150 years old and hasn't got a paradigmatic experiment to offer yet. So I don't know, or a mechanism, or an operative mechanism. So I... I don't know, uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I always, as decades of activism, as a skeptical activist this, in the Q and A, somebody always says, um, are you optimistic about uh, the outcome for, you know, human race and reason thinking? And I always say, hell no, no, no chance. Um, skepticism is just a dirty job that somebody has to do. And, um, you know, from my person, the personal reward is great people I meet, like the people we're talking to today. Um, so because uh, the nice thing is, is that, you know, science, some scientists like to hang out with magicians and some magicians like to hang out with scientists. So sometimes that really works out. That's a really nice thing. Um, the, you know, the problem at the risk of stating the obvious, I'm talking to two psychologists now, so I'm stating the obvious. But for the larger audience, the problem <laughs> is that human minds are hardwired we're hardwired millions of years ago on the african plain to be lousy thinkers well but lousy thinkers by today by contemporary what serves contemporary society at the mm -hmm. time trying to hunt socially and survive and kill and eat animals that were beyond you know wildly larger and required social hunting and all these other things you develop these cognitive bias all these cognitive biases you you develop you know this instantaneous sense of cause and effect and pattern seeking and all of this stuff which served us once it's hardwired into our brain it's not going to change in an industrial age that's you know 100 years old or if you want to say 400 years old whatever you want to say so um this is the problem you know cognitive dissonance suddenly the big brain comes, we have consciousness. Who says consciousness was a good idea? Personally, I think consciousness was an accident of evolution that's actually maladapted. That's another conversation for another day. Um, I mean, I believe that actually. I had a great conversation with my friend um, Dan Dennett about that some years ago. Um, so I think that's the, the logical outcome. It's probably maladapted. Um, but you, if you're going to have the big brain and you're self-aware, you have to have you have to have a way to resolve cognitive dissonance because you're always going to be wrong. Every day of your life, you're going to be wrong about something. And how do you survive that? Well, OK, we know how we survive that. So um, it's a, uh, 
there was a book written uh, like 30, 25 years ago now called The Uncommon Sense by Frohler, I think. And I always liked it because it pointed out very clearly, a small book, that the scientific method is not a natural way for human beings to think. It's not natural for us to say, I'm going to take my personal experience and just throw that over here in the trash. And I'm going to listen. I'm going to guide my life by some abstract ideas that a bunch of scientists writing papers I'll never read, scientists I'll never meet. That's how I'm going to guide my life. That's the path to salvation for the human species as it happens. But it's as sure as hell is not a natural way that this species of hominids evolved to operate on a day to day basis. So it's a losing proposition. And dare I say it, the only thing that gives us a fighting chance is uh, teaching a scientific worldview, the scientific method, rational thinking, and critical inquiry, and how to test your sources. <laughs> Cool, cool. So that's right. my that's my version, Matthew, of the good news. Cheers, man. That was uh, so that was optimistic in a myth of Sisyphus kind of existential. <laughs> so kind I think of, we'll, we'll take it. Way. We'll yeah. take it. All right. Thank you so much. Kind of like time. the guy this on the bomb at the end. Kind of like the guy on the bomb at the end of uh, uh, at the end of Doctor oh, Strange. Oh yeah, Doctor Strange. Yeah. <laughs> we'll meet again. Don't know where. Don't know where. Uh. That deserves a rewatch recently, uh, <laughs> given the current circumstances. Yep. Anyway, <laughs> all right. No fighting in the war room, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Um, this was a really great conversation.